Hello and welcome to part 6 of my Godot VR weapons tutorial. My name is Bastian Rai and today we're going to add a display for ammo count, a smoke trail and a muscle flash effect. Ammo count in a normal desktop game is usually shown in a corner of the screen, but in VR it makes more sense to show it on the gun. The best way to do that is take that into account in the design of your gun and build a display in. Our Colt 1911 doesn't have that, so we'll display the ammo count next to the gun. The approach is no different however, it's just how you apply the texture. We need to create a viewport into which we're going to render our amount count. We'll name it amount count viewport. Next we'll size this viewport. The size will depend on how close we'll display it. Using power of 2 values is always smart here, so we'll make this a 256 by 256 pixels viewport. We'll disable 3D and turn the viewport into a 2D viewport. And we set our update mode to once. We will trigger an update only when the ammo count changes. We'll add a label to our viewport. This will render the ammo count. We default the text to 12 and rename the label to ammo count. Now we don't actually see our label. This is because our preview is showing our main viewport. The workaround for this is to save our label as a subscene. In this case a little overkill, but for more complex viewports having the logic in a subscene isn't a bad thing. Now we can see our label and start to set it up properly. The first thing we'll do is resize our field so it spans our entire viewport. We also want to center our text, but it's very tiny. We could scale our text, but that will look pretty ugly. A nicer solution is to add a custom font. Here we select new dynamic font. I've downloaded a font from the web which we select here. I've put a link to it in the description below. Make sure you get a true type font here. Now we can change the font size to actually make the text bigger. We'll fiddle around with the size a bit until we get something that fits. Our ammo count is now rendered to our viewport, but we still don't see it near our gun. We'll add a mesh instance to our scene. We'll call this display ammo count. We'll add a quad mesh to this instance. Now we'll move it out a bit so we can see it, but here we notice that it is very tiny. The reason is that I parented the object to the gun and way back we scaled our gun down to size. So let's reparent the mesh instance. Now we can change our scale back to 1 and see that our quad is indeed as large as it should be. We resize our quad by sizing the quad itself. A size of 3 by 3 centimeters seems okay enough. Let's adjust the positioning a little more and rotate it slightly so it will be easier to see the count. Now we add a spatial material to our object. And we'll create a viewport texture for our albedo texture. This texture is bound to a viewport and we'll use its output as our texture. Godot will tell us that our resource must be set to local for this to work. By default, Godot will share a resource with every instance of a scene that uses it. Our material will be shared, but will have a unique viewport for every instance of our gun. So we turn on local to scene on our material to ensure that every time our gun is instanced, we get a unique material. Now we can create our viewport texture and Godot will ask us to point out the viewport. And there we have it, but it's upside down. We quickly toggle V flip on our viewport. Because we have random mode set to once, we have to trigger an update by resetting the random mode. While we're here, we'll also change our viewport to transparent and again reset our render mode. Now this makes the background black, but that is because we need to change our material as well. We simply turn on our transparent flag in the material properties. We'll also turn our unshaded flag on. Let's go into our script so we can update our ammo count. We'll create a function called setAmmunition that will update our ammunition count so we have a single place to maintain. Leave it up to old habits to use the wrong comparison operator. 
Now we change the code where we update our ammunition and call our new function. We can simply assign the text of our label to the new ammunition count. And then change our viewport's update mode to once to trigger an update. Now we can see that when we shoot our ammo counter decreases nicely until we're out of ammo. And when we reload our gun we see our ammo count return to 12. So far we've not done anything about our controllers. It is nice to see our controller mesh when we're not holding anything. But when we pick up our gun, having it stick in the middle of the controller is rather ugly. So let's use the signals we introduced a little while ago to hide the controllers when we're holding something. We can create a new script on our controller node, but because we already have a script, Godot will automatically extend the script. I'm creating a new folder to hold our scripts and a subfolder for our player scripts. Even though they will do the same thing, for now we'll create a script for each hand. And we clear out the code that is there. We quickly do the same for our right hand controller. Now we select our function node on our left hand controller and connect our signals to our script. We connect our has picked up signal and we connect our has dropped signal. Now we repeat this for our right hand controller as well. We need to hide our controller mesh that is inside of our controller scene. Because it's bad form to access this directly, we'll add a property to our controller script that gives us access to showing and hiding this mesh. We add an export variable called showControllerMesh. Then we write our setter function that updates our variable and if our node is accessible, changes its visibility. And we write our getter that simply returns our variable. Finally, we initialize our visible flag on our node in our ready function. Now we simply hide our controller mesh when we pick up an object. And make it visible again when we drop the object. And we copy the code to our right hand controller script. And here we see the result. Our left hand controller disappears when we pick up our gun. And our right hand controller disappears while we're holding a magazine. This next bit, I have to admit, took me a few tries to get something I was half happy with. Even now, I think I could easily put several more hours into this to improve the look. We're going to create a smoke trail that follows our bullet. Total overkill and unrealistic, but a lot of fun. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that after we fire, our bullet travel lasts for a couple hundred milliseconds. In that time, our player could move, and if our effect is parented to our gun, or even to our controller, the effect would move with it. So we'll end up spawning our effect into our main scene like we did with our casings. To start building our effect, we are going to add it to our scene temporarily. We start by adding a spatial as a parent object. We'll call that smoke. Then we move our spatial into position so it is roughly in front of our muzzle. Next, we're going to add a particle system. We have two options here. CPU particles is a particle implementation that runs purely on the CPU. It runs on any hardware, but its performance is limited. Particles, however, runs on the GPU but requires the Glass 3 driver. As it runs on the GPU, it can handle hundreds of thousands of particles, and we'll be using this today. I'm going to move the particle system a little forward so we can more easily see what is happening. Also, notice as I move around that there is a big yellow box around our particle system. This box is a bounding box that won't be visible to the player. As long as this box is visible to the camera, our particle system will execute and draw itself. Now as we look more closely at our particle emitter, we notice that we do not see any particles. Still, our particle system has emitting set to true, and we're supposed to be emitting 8 particles. 
This is because we need to set our particle system up first, and there are a couple of steps. The first is to open up the Process Material tab and create a new process material. This is a special shader that runs on the GPU and controls the position of our particles. The second thing we need to do is open up our Draw Passes tab and create a mesh that the particle system will draw for each particle. We'll add a simple quad mesh here. Whoa, that's a little big. As we zoom out, we see a bundle of overlapping large squares being emitted from our particle emitter. So let's adjust the size of our quads to something a little more manageable. Let's make them a centimeter by a centimeter. Now we can see our particle system is emitting small squares at a very regular rate. The squares are falling down thanks to the default gravity setting of our process material. This is not what we want, so we'll very quickly change that. We open up the particles material and find the gravity tab. I'm changing the gravity to a pretty small positive value. Smoke rises after all. We don't want grey squares for our particle system either. So next we create a spatial material for our mess. We open up our material and start by assigning a smoke texture as our albedo color. This texture came from the particles demo and will do fine for us today. Our particles still have a weird background. We need to turn the transparency on. Also in this case we don't care about lighting, so we make our material unshaded. We also turn on this setting called Use as Albedo on the Vertex Color tab. This doesn't have an effect yet, but it allows us to output a color from our particle shader that is then used when rendering our particle. Next we need to change two settings in our Parameters tab. When I move around, you'll notice that the particles always face one way, but we want our particles to always face the camera. This is called billboarding, and under our billboard mode we find a very aptly named particle billboard option. Now when we look around, we always see our smoke particles. The final change we make is to change our blend mode. We set this to additive. Additive means that we add the color of our particle to whatever is already there. The more particles overlap, the brighter the color. Right now this results in a white blob, but once we do more with colors, the effect will become clear. Note that when we move our particles material around, all our particles move with it. To remedy this, we'll open our drawing tab and turn the tick box local chords off. Now you can see that as I move our emitter, new particles will be emitted from the new location. But already emitted particles will continue on independent of the emitter. We want our emitter to travel along the trajectory of our bullet. We could use our physics system here, and possibly this is something we'll do in the future, but for now we add an animation player for this. We want to parent this to our spatial, not our particle system. We create a new animation and we call this Travel. Now we select our particle emitter, close all the tabs, reset our translation and create a starting keyframe. Next we'll move to the end of our animation. Move our translation a bit further out and create our ending keyframe. Now we can see that our bounding box isn't big enough, so we're going to resize it. We're going to make it less wide and high as our particles will be contained along a line but we increase the length so it reaches our gun. Making the height only 3 meters instead of 4 is a mistake, but not one will notice. It still is plenty big. For now we'll loop our animation while we set things up. For some reason our track defaulted to discrete. That caught me off guard. We need to change this to continuous. Now when we press play our animation starts playing. We see our particle emitter nicely move away from our gun until it reaches its end and repeats. 8 particles, however, is hardly enough. So let's start increasing that to 100. Hmm, they are still pretty far apart, so let's move that to 1000. Hmm. Note how the particles are still spaced out, but did get brighter, meaning we have loads of particles in one spot. The reason for this is that this is the distance our emitter travels each frame. 
we don't get any in-between steps. Incidentally, this is also a nice visualization of why physics of moving bodies sometimes miss a collision, because they step over the object they are supposed to collide with. So we're going to fix that up. For that, we go to our process material. We need to change our emission shape. Instead of emitting at a point, we'll emit particles inside of a box. We immediately see our particles are all over the place. We thus change the size of our box to roughly the step size of our animation. It doesn't need to be exact. Let's pause our animation. Let me reposition that a little so we can see what is going on. Here we can see all particles being emitted inside of our little box. Now all our particles are emitted here, but as our emitter moves, only a few dozen are emitted each frame, and we spread our particles out along our trajectory. I've restarted our animation. We're going to change the color of our particles over its lifetime. Open up the color tab and create a new gradient texture under our color ramp option. Inside here we need to create a new gradient. The color of our particle will change during its lifetime depending on the color set in our gradient. This interface is a little bit fidgety. We'll start with a color blue for our first control point. Next we add a new control point pretty close to the first, which we change to an orangey color. The control point after that we place a little further away. This one will give a dark grey color and make it transparent. Finally, we change our end control point to black and totally transparent. We already see that our particles nicely fade out towards the end of their life. Next we'll do something similar to the scale of our particles. We open up the scale tab, we create a new scale curve, we set the minimum value to 1 and with our maximum value to 25. Now we make the scale at the end higher and we see that our smoke particles nicely grow. Let's turn our repeat animation off. Now let's make sure our emitter starts emitting when our animation starts and stops emitting when the animation stops by creating some keyframes. We save our smoke system as a new subscene. And we delete it from our scene. Just like our casing scene, we add an export variable to our script and assign our new scene to this variable. We add a new spatial to our scene so we can position our smoke spawn point. Again, just like we did with our casings. In our script, we duplicate our emit casings code and turn it into an emit smoke function. It's pretty much the same code, except that we don't have any velocity. We quickly return to our animation player and make sure that we autoplay our animation when our scene gets added. And now we call our new emit function when we fire our gun. Now we can see that every time we shoot our gun we create a new smoke trail. It is clear from this that our bullet travels way too slowly. We're going to speed up our animation by making it 0.2 seconds long by dragging our keys in. That also means our emitter travels much further between frames, and we thus need to increase our emission box. 
we also adjust our starting point in our first key. With our much wider emission box, our smoke would come out the back of our gun. I'm also moving our finish position further out by changing our ending keyframe. Now note that even though we've adjusted our animation to 0.2 seconds, we're not changing the lifetime of our emitted particles. This means that the particles still take a full 1.5 seconds to go through their individual animations. We do need to adjust the number of particles emitted. Right now we emit 2000 particles over 1.5 seconds, but we're only emitting for 0.2 seconds. That means we only emit just over 250 particles. I'm changing this to 10,000 particles, which will result in roughly 1300 particles being emitted over our 0.2 second lifetime. To complete our fire effect, we're going to add a muscle flash. Now, I'm not a very good artist, so I've downloaded a nice free asset from OpenGameDev.com made by user Julius. I've put the link down below. We start by adding a new mesh instance to our gun node. We'll move this nicely in front of our muzzle. I'll call this Muzzle Flash. How original. Now we'll load the mesh provided by Julius into this mesh instance. And that is way too big, so we scale it down a bit. Now we can move it into position a bit better. This object has multiple materials that should all be the same, so we're just going to use our material override to create a new special material. Now we can load the texture supplied by Julius into our albedo slot. Now the logical thing here is to make this material transparent, however not much happens when we do so. Our texture doesn't have an alpha channel. Because the background is black we can cheat, but before we do so we'll also make this material unshaded. We open up parameters and also make this material additive. Immediately we see that this also makes our material transparent. This is because adding black does nothing. That looks pretty cool, but as we move our camera to the back side of our muzzle flash, we see that we're missing something. That is easily remedied by turning the cull mode to disabled. Looking around now, we can see our flash is drawn from all sides, and here we can really see how additive blending makes it look like a real flame. Our muzzle flash should be invisible by default. The muzzle flash we can fully animate with our existing animation player, so we select that. And find our fire animation. And adjust our time scale so we can see our timeline more closely. We create a keyframe to make our muzzle flash visible at 0.04 seconds. And make it invisible at 0.06 seconds. We really only need to see the muzzle flash for a frame or two. One thing I nearly forgot is making sure our muzzle flash doesn't cast a shadow. That would look weird. I also found that our flash looked really small, so I'm going to make it a fair bit larger. Let's make our flash visible again so we can check the size. Yeah, that looks much better. Let's make it invisible again. Now we quickly go back to our smoke particle scene, because this also shouldn't cast a shadow. To make sure our flash casts a light on our environment, we'll also add an omni light to our scene. We position this a bit forward of our gun. We'll rename this to flash. And we return to our animation player and turn our light on and off in sync with our muzzle flash object. Now when we shoot we see our smoke trail. Our muzzle flash and the light illuminate the environment. This can use a bit more tweaking. All in all I'm pretty happy with the end result. This pretty much finishes the effects I wanted to add to my pistol. In the next video we'll look into throwables. If you don't want to miss that, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification button. Or follow me on Twitter where I regularly give status updates on what I'm working on. If you enjoyed this video I would really appreciate a like. I'm on Patreon. If you want to support me in what I do here on YouTube, please consider donating a cup of coffee a month. Thanks for watching, until next time.